Hi there at home. Thank you for being part of Muso Church Online Experience today. My name is Tato and this is Koketo. Mm -hmm. And we have the privilege of leading Musa Church, which is based in Pretoria in South Africa. Mm. But you might be watching from anywhere in the world yeah, and not even know where that is. Yeah, you might not even know where Pretoria is. But even if we are not able to connect with you physically, yeah. we are thinking about and praying. We're praying for you. We are so honored that during this period of lockdown, mm. we are still able to continue to bring you quality online Muso Church experiences weekly. Yeah, indeed. And if you do not have a family church, if you are not in a church yet and you're looking around for a church to belong to, send us a DM and we would like to connect with you. Alternatively, you can go to your App Store or Google Store and download an app called Go Do church and after you've downloaded this app register yourself it should take you about five minutes or less and it is absolutely absolutely free once registered search for Musa church and you are plugged in yeah and you are within yeah this way we are able to send you weekly updates mm -hmm. we are able to send encouragement mm -hmm. and you will be able to access some mm -hmm. of our awesome church material yeah 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 and 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 not only that then you'll be connected to a loving community of church yeah. but for now sit back relax and enjoy the service welcome, welcome home, home. I don't know where you are and I don't know what you are going through. But you might be watching this and feeling a sense of discouragement. You might be feeling discouraged in your heart. You might be feeling discouraged socially, emotionally, psychologically, financially, relationally. You might be feeling discouraged to live. You might be feeling discouraged because of the situation you find yourself. And as we sing the song, Oh, come, O Holy Spirit, and fill me up, I am reminded of the description that Jesus used in John 16 when he says, I will leave you with the Holy Spirit. And he describes the Holy Spirit as the divine encourager. And I trust that as you have been singing the song, you will experience the encouragement of the Holy Spirit in this moment. That you will experience him as a divine encourager in your life. That you hear him telling you that it is not going to end like this. This is not the end. This is not how your life ends. This is not how it will always be. Things will turn around for good. Things are working out for your good. Things will come all right. Keep holding on, keep pressing on, keep moving on, and keep running on, knowing that you have a divine encourager who is encouraging you this morning, saying, it does not end like this. What God has promised you will surely come to pass. If you are at home and you're feeling a sense of discouragement, know that in the Holy Spirit, as we are singing the song just now, know that you have the Holy Spirit who is a divine encourager and he's ready, willing, and able to encourage you in this season. And may you open your heart for his encouragement. May you invite him into your heart this moment and say holy spirit come into my heart and make my heart your home because he is a divine encourager i pray this morning that you will have an encounter with a divine encourager i pray this morning that you will have an encounter with a divine encourager and you live with a sense with a sense of hope Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody at home. I'm trusting that you are having a blessed Sunday morning. It really has been an incredible one for me and my family. And we are so glad that you could join us this morning. We do not take for granted the time that you set apart to join us. Uh, we are so encouraged by you and your contribution to what we are doing. 
We thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your giving. We thank you for your messages of encouragement and, and just well wishes. We are strong because of you and we pray and celebrate you. We pray to God in thanksgiving because of you. We are really, really, really grateful. This morning, we are starting a new series titled Hashtag YOLO. YOLO is an acronym that means you only live once. It's a popular acronym that was actually popularized by the internet in 2012. It became a very popular uh, 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 phrase. And, 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 and in the next five weeks, we're going to have different preachers come on just to talk about this theme or to talk around this theme, YOLO, you only live once. Unfortunately, this is a term or an acronym that has been used when people want to make bad decisions, or where rather when people want to justify their bad decisions, then they say you only live once. When people want to justify reckless living, then they say you only live once, so you might as well live it anyhow. This is a phrase that has that has seen a lot of people destroy their lives. This is a, a, a lot of people. This is a, this is a phrase that has seen people with potential destroy their lives. This is a phrase that has seen people with prospects destroy their lives. This is a phrase that has seen people who had a stable life plunged into misery, all because you live once. And you might as well live anyhow. And during this season, during this, this series, we want to repurpose this, this acronym, You Only Live Once. We want, we want to restore the essence of, of, this, of, this, of this acronym, You Only Live Once, because it is true. And it is not by chance, but by the design of God that we live only once. It is, it is according to God's plan that we live only once because he knows that once is enough for us to live out the purposes and calling, the dreams and the visions and ideas that he has put within us. God knows that once is enough. A lot of us sometimes say, you know, I wish there was more than 24 hours in a day. Let me tell you this. God was not mistaken when he created just 24 hours. He knows that it is enough for you to rest. It's enough for you to have impact. It's enough for you to enjoy, to enjoy life. So when you say you only live once, it is not a negative statement. It is a positive statement because God designed it that way that you live only once knowing that once is enough for you to make the impact that he has called you to make. He knows that once is enough for you to make the difference that he wants you to make. He knows that once is enough for you to change the world. He knows that once is enough for you to make the mark that he has called you to make you live only once make make it count your law make it count you live only once you get only one chance at this life make it count and everything that you need to make this life count, it is already inside of you. God has already placed each and everything, every idea necessary, every energy needed, every, every, every strength required, every aptitude needed for you to live a life of impact, making a difference, and a life of success and significance. It is already in you and this life, one life is enough for you to live a life of fruitfulness, of multiplication, of dominion. 
once is enough. Make it, make it count. Make it, make it count. If you are living your life to make it count, you stop asking. This is the first thing. If you want to live a life that counts, if you want this one life of yours to be a life that counts, you need to live your life not asking the question, what makes me happy, but you ask the question, what makes God happy? What pleases God? We do not live to fulfill our own desires, but we live to fulfill God's desires. And God's desires are always to our benefit for his glory. We live from a point of pleasing God and not a point of pleasing ourselves. And here is the thing about pleasing God. You can never destroy your life pleasing God. You can never sabotage your life pleasing God. You can never uh, mess up your life pleasing God. You can never destroy your promises pleasing God. You can never, you know, delete or destroy your potential, your profit, or, or, or your potency pleasing God. In pleasing God, your strength multiplies. In pleasing God, your, your, your power multiplies. Multiplies. In pleasing God, your profitability multiplies. In pleasing God, your, 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 your potential turns into profit. That's why Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 8, when he's speaking to the children of Israel, he says to them, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. What is he saying? He's saying to them, when God, when God is pleased, I am strengthened. When God is pleased, I am strengthened. When I am living to please God, my strength multiplies. When I am living to please God, my energy multiplies. When I am living to please God, ideas, my creativity multiplies. I become more fruitful. I become become more potent. I become more profitable. I become more creative. I become more of a contributor when I live to please God. So when I want to live a life that counts, I live it to please, to please God. Say so YOLO, live it pleasing God. YOLO, live it pleasing God. There is a notion that when we become Christian, we become stupid and, and, and we do not think. That cannot be true. That is not true. That is a fallacy. It is not true. It is what people make or say. It's stories that people make up when they want to destroy, steal, and kill the dreams and the purposes of God inside of us. Instead, when we become Christians like Nehemiah, our strength is multiplied. That's why Jesus says to to, 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 to the serpent to say, not, you, you, there is nothing, men, I was not actually, he says, he says, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. He says, it is not the things of this world that edifies me, but it is a word from God that edifies me. I, I, I do not chase the pleasures of this world for my satisfaction. My satisfaction comes from the word of God, from drinking from his well, from listening to him, from sitting at his feet and enjoying what he has for me. He's saying I have one life and I had better get on pleasing God and not pleasing my own desire. Not bread is going to satisfy me, but but every word that comes out of God's mouth satisfies me. God's word does not make us dull, it makes us sharp. God's word does not make us lazy, it makes us productive. God's word does not make us scared, it, it gives us courage. 
So if you want to live a life that counts, we live a life pleasing, pleasing God. They say, God, what, what pleases? Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. What brings God joy gives me strength. When he is happy, I am strong. The inverse is true. What grieves God disempowers us. What grieves God weakens us. When we live against the will of God, we become weak. When we live against the, 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 the idea, the, 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 the intention, the, the mandate and the calling of God, we become weak. If we claim that we only live once, we had better live that life pleasing, pleasing God. We had better be, live that life pleasing, pleasing, pleasing God. You only live once. And once is enough. You only live once. Make it, make it count. Why should you make it count? Because your life matters. Because your life matters. Your life matters to God. And because there are people around you whose life also matters to God, he has placed a seed, ideas and gifts inside of you that will promote a good quality of life for them. God has not put you in the community where you are for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the people around you because your life, your life counts. And you might be sitting there and say, I am just a teacher. I'm just an engineer. I'm just a doctor. I mean, I'm just a, a, a small time entrepreneur. I'm just, you know, kind of figuring life out. I'm just a stay at home mom. I am just, you know, you, you use just to belittle yourself. You might be sitting there and say, what do you mean my life counts? I am just a student. I am just a, 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 a you know, a, a vendor. Uh, not like a vendor as in vendor, but a vendor as in vendor. I didn't say nothing, right? Not a vendor as in like from Limpopo, but a vendor as in a street vendor. Yeah, well, probably it's not funny. Anyway, but you're sitting there and you're like, I don't think my life counts. David was sitting in the field. He probably didn't think his life counted until Samuel showed up and anointed him and David went on to lead nations into great victory. Joseph probably didn't think his life counted when he was the least favorite in the family until God visited him in a dream and showed him that he's going to set up an economy of a nation and say your life counts. Yes, right now you are the least in your family, but your life counts and I'm going to establish a new economic system through your life. Gideon was hiding in a cave thinking his life does not matter, but God said I am going to visit him and when God visited Gideon, Gideon went on to lead nations into great victories because of a visitation of God. Peter was a failed fisherman and he had probably given up. The Bible says when Jesus approached Peter, Peter was already washing his net because he had not caught anything for the night. So it means he had failed throughout the night to catch and he was picking his net and throwing it away and giving up. 
And Jesus shows up and he turns Peter. He says to Peter, your life counts. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And Peter went ahead to become the greatest church planter we have ever known. Because when we think our life does not matter, in God's eyes it matters. And it so matters so much that he will make an appointment to visit us. Whether we are in the field shepherding a ship, whether we are in the, in, in the harbor washing our nets and about to give up, whether you are a stay-at-home mom or whether you are a teacher, God has an appointment with you that comes and reminds you that your life matters and that he wants to do something great with it. So when you say YOLO, say it from a conviction of no in that somewhere along this journey if you have not discovered it yet there is a visitation from God that is going to move you from looking as yourself as just into looking at yourself as a king in the kingdom of God as a princess in the kingdom of God as a prince in the in the kingdom of God as a as a weapon in the arm of God these guys, they were just shepherds, written off, failures, all of them. But they had a divine visitation from God. And that divine visitation changed the trajectory of their lives. And I want to say to you, if you have not had your moment of visitation, God does not miss his appointment. He has set an appointment with you. And let me tell you the truth. That appointment is not in the next lifetime. That appointment is in this lifetime. When he says, YOLO, know that God in this lifetime, he is going to visit visit you and that visitation will propel you and I'm praying to God that sooner rather than later you will experience that visitation from God that will come and propel you from one level to the next that will come and show you that your life counts one man by the name of Nehemiah some call it Nehemiah whatever you want to call him, finds himself in a space where he is a cupbearer in the enemy's camp. Though it was the enemy's camp, he was quite comfortable. Uh, well, comfortable is a relative term. But the fact of the matter is he was a cupbearer in the enemy's camp. And he has a divine visitation. His brothers from, from Israel come to him and say to him, Nehemiah, while you are here serving wine to the king, the walls in the city of Jerusalem have fallen, have fallen down. The walls are destroyed. This is what they say. Nehemiah 1 from verses 2. Hanani one of my brothers. Now this is Nehemiah narrating the story. Came to visit me with other men who had arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jew who had returned from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. See what he's doing. He's not just concerned about his own life. He's saying, what's happening out there? How are my people? How are people's God living? What quality of life are people out there living? If we're going to live a life that counts, we can't just be concerned about our own lives. We also need to be concerned about the lives of other people around us. Nehemiah is asking the question, how are people in, in my hometown doing? When was the last time you, you, you asked how are your neighbors doing? How are family members doing? How are your church members doing we cannot if we're going to live a life that counts we cannot just focus on our own life we need to ask the question how are people around me doing and they said to me things are not well for those who return from the province of judah 
they are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem have torn down. The gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I moaned, fasted, prayed to God of the heavens. A lot of us are asking the question, how do I live a life that counts? Number one, I said, live to please God. Number two, discover what breaks your heart. What breaks your heart? What is it that when you see your heart gets broken in Matthew 9 verses 39, 36 rather, the Bible says, when he saw the crowd, Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed, helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The thing about Jesus is what moves his heart is our lostness to the point that he will leave the 99 to come for the one. If you are the one who is in a tavern while everyone is in church, guess where Jesus will be found? Jesus will be found in the tavern looking for you. If you are the one who is in a fornication relationship while everyone is in, you know, they are pure, they are there at church singing all the hallelujah. Guess where Jesus will be found? He will be found out there looking for you. If you are the one in a strip club, in a brothel, in a beer house, in a broken and desolate place, lost and broken, guess where Jesus will be found? He will be found in the tavern, in the brothel, in the strip club looking for you because he is a kind of shepherd that leaves the 99 for the one. That is what breaks Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart is broken by the lostness of his sheep. And in that we see what makes his life count. That's why he stood on the cross and died because he was moved by the lostness of one. Moses was moved by, by the brutality against the, 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 the Israelites to a point where he had to divorce and forfeit the pleasantries that he enjoyed in the palace. Moses was living in the palace comfortably as a prince. But when he saw the suffering of the Israelites, he could not ignore that because what moves us determines what makes our life count. What breaks our heart determines what makes our life count. I want to ask you a question. What breaks your heart? What moves you? What is it that when you see, you cannot help but be moved? When, when, when you see, you cannot help but feel a sense of sorrow and pain. In that, you will discover what makes your life count. Many of us are asking God, God, show me what will make my life count. What is the meaning of my life? And oftentimes the answer is found in what breaks our hearts. Oftentimes the answer is found in what moves us. Some are moved by social disorder. You might be called to be a community leader. Some are moved by moral decay. Some, you might be moved, you might be called to be a social entrepreneur. Some are moved by purposeful living. You might be called to be a human, develop, human capacity developer like myself. Some are moved by political unrest. You might be called to be a politician, a political leader. Some are moved by social injustice. You might be called to be a lawyer, a judge, or an activist. Some are moved by the pain of others. You might be called to be in social services. Some are moved by the ignorance in others. You might be called to be a teacher. Some are moved by people being sad and feeling lifeless. You might be called to be in the entertainment space. Some are moved by lost souls. You might be called to be an evangelist. There's many things. If you want to discover what makes your life count. 
determine what breaks your heart. When you understand what breaks your heart, you get a clearer understanding what makes your life count. And when you pursue that, when you go about finding solutions to that which break your heart, you live a life that matters. You live a life that matters. As we close, many of us are saying, I, do, I don't think I have enough to live a life that counts. I don't think I have what it takes to live a life that counts. I don't think I am strong enough, smart enough, connected enough, educated enough to live a life that counts. Nehemiah goes to the king after he realizes what breaks his heart, this big problem in front of him. He goes to the king to have a conversation with the king because he realizes that, look, I, 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 I need, I don't have what it takes, but there is a king who might have. <laughs> Many of us, the things that break our heart, on our own, we will not be able to make the difference. But in the Holy Spirit, we have a divine helper and a divine encourager who will make sure that we live the life that counts. We don't have to do it by ourselves. The Bible says, he who has begun this good work in you is faithful to see it to completion. He says, I am faithful to see it com to completion if you take a step. Because if you take one step, I take ten. And, and, and your small effort, I multiply. God multiplies our small efforts, not our small intentions. Not what we, we intend to do, but what we actually do. Life, big difference is not made through intentions. It's made through actions. So Nehemiah goes to the king. In the month of Nis, of the 12th year of the king, when, when I brought the wine to him, this is Nehemiah, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been said in his presence before. His heart was broken. So the king asked me, why, do, why does your face look so sad? Are you not well? Are you ill? <clears throat> then he says, I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, my king live forever. May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins? Its gates are down and destroyed by fire. Why should I not be sad when the lives of people are being taken? Why should I not be sad when the lives of black people are being taken as if they don't matter? Why should I not be sad when the lives of women in our country are taken at the hands of their lovers, their fathers, their brothers, and their uncles? Why should I not be sad when children are being abused? Why should I not be sad when there's so much corruption in our government? Why should I not be sad when a lot of young, young people are unemployed? Why should I not be sad when a lot of black people are still living in poverty? Why should I not be sad? There's, guys, there's plenty of reason for us to be sad. We have plenty of reason for us to be sad. We, 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 anywhere we look, we have reason why we should be sad. He says to the king, what, how can I not be sad when this is my reality? When I think I, I, I'm dealing with racism as a woman, I also have to deal with femicide. Why would I not be sad? As a man, as a black man, why would I not be sad when, when my, the color of my skin determines the opportunity I get granted? When the color of my skin determines if I get to speak or not? When the color of my skin determines if I have a future in corporate world or not? Why should I not be sad? Why should I not be sad when, 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 when systems of this world is trying to, to silence the church? When there's moral decay, young people are throwing their lives away into drug, sex, and alcohol. Why should I not be sad? There's enough, guys, to make us sad. There is enough. 
Why should I not be sad when so many people die at the hands of their lovers? Why should I not be sad when girls are throwing, out their, are throwing away their lives just to survive? Why should I not be sad when, when, when young women have to sell their bodies just so that they can have something to eat and feed their families? Why should I not be sad? Why should I not be sad when, when men are suffering depression because of the pressures in their families, in their homes? Why should I not be sad? Why should I not be sad? There's enough things around to make me sad. And the king asked, what can I do for you? There's three things that as we come before God and ask him for empowerment, <clears throat> he gives us. He gives us three things. When you come before God and say, God, I want to live a life that counts, a life that matters, you can be guaranteed that he will give you three things. Number one, the king asked, what can I do for you? Then I prayed to the gods of heaven. And he answered the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send, let him send me to the city of Judah where my sisters are buried so that I can go and rebuild it. God will give you permission. What is permission? He gives you the right to speak. He gives you the authority to speak. When you come into the situation, out of a position of prayer, you do no longer speak of your own accord, but you have the divine backing of heaven backing you up. He got permission. So don't be afraid of what will you say. Don't be afraid of how you will say it. Whether you have the enough expertise or not, you will gain divine permission. Permission is authority. It gives you a letter that says, I permit you to make a decision on my behalf. God says, I've given you permission to be light to this world. It says, you have the permission of God to stand and to speak. And when he gives you permission, he gives you, he gives you strength. Moses in Exodus 33 asked God, when God asks him to go and speak to the Israelites, he says, God, when I get there, suppose they ask me, who sent me? What will I say? He says, say to them, that I am who I am sent you. We come in the name of the I am. That's why David says, you come at me with javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. We are coming in the name of the life we live. We live in the name of the Lord. Number two. So number one is permission. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will this journey take? When will you get back? And then I said, it's also said to, I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I also get a letter to the governors of trans Ephesus so that they will provide me a safe conduct until I arrive. Protection. Number two, God will protect you as you stand up for what is right. God will give you permission to stand up for what is right and he will give you protection as you stand up for what is right. Number three, and may I also have a letter uh, 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 for the keepers of the royal park so that they will give me timber and for the beams of the gates uh, for the temple. Provision. So God will also give you provision as you stand for what is right. Number one, he will give you permission to stand for what is right. Number two, he will give you protection as you stand for what is right. Number three, he will give you provision because some of you, you don't want to stand because you're worried you'll lose your job. You're worried you'll lose your income. You don't want to speak out because you're worried you will lose your streams of income. God will provide for you for as long as you stand for justice and what is right. You only live once. Make it count. We trust that God spoke to you in a profound way and that you remembered that God loves you and he has an incredible plan for our city through your life. We thank you that we can journey with you and build a church that builds our city together. See you again next week.